So I'll, I'll bore you with a little bit about our organization, and then I'll get into the meat and bones of rewilding. And I will try to keep a reference of what you bought in there. But I forgot all about it, so remind me when the pictures start coming. Remind me of because rewilding has got a lot to say about the water bottles. So um, quickly, um, we created um, Wildwood Trust um, a long time ago. It was three people, um, myself, Ken West, who founded the um, Kent Mammal Group, and um, is uh, very much involved in mammals, and a chap called Terry Stanford, who was a forester. He opened the Wildlife Park. Um, this is about the 1980s, early 1980s, and um, they were losing all. He had some red squirrels and some pallogies. I believe, in his little park. It then went through various incarnations. Then Ken, who um, fantastic stalwart of the mammal community, and my mentor, he was a trustee at Kent Wildlife Trust. I was working at Kent Wildlife Trust. We decided we wanted to reintroduce beavers. And that comes from a long story of why we wanted to reintroduce beavers, um, because of rewilding. And rewilding wasn't even a common term in those days. It was just understanding ecology and a keystone species. So that is really what we wanted to guess if we could unpeel that onion. And so we wanted to create um, Wildwood Trust. Originally it was myself, uh, Professor Richard Griffiths, who was my old professor at the Daryl Institute, I don't know if you know him, a wonderful chap, he's a purpose guy. Mm -hmm. He's got to have some fault. And Ken, we were the original three uh, trustees. It was going to go bust and we decided to be trustees, and I set the charity up, did all the boring things, uh, to set up a charity and start running it, and then I had to go work in there because it really was going to go bust if I didn't jump ship. Um, so, rewilding and reintroductions, the first projects we kind of did was the uh, conic ponies, getting them to manage nature reserves and the beavers, and then we started getting into heavily into water ball reintroductions, and um, at that time, we've since then, been checking out door lights left, right, and centre, which all was hazel, never stop working. In fact, if you go to the Kent Mammal Group, I think about half the people in it are pretty much employees of one of trust. Not that we have positively discriminate or anything like that. Um, we also push for education and training, we're a membership organisation, community organisation, we do lots of things, and obviously we try to promote rewilding and its concepts to where are we now. We're 13 years old, nearly 14, we've got 60,000 members now. That's why we've got lots of money and lots of staff. We've got 102 staff. I can't remember the name. <laughs> we're financially secure, strangely. We lurch from crisis to crisis, but it all seems to be good. We're financially secure. We've got a real growing reputation and public profile. In fact, Ellie will be singing our praises on Country File on Sunday, if you care to watch. Um, we've opened up a new wildwood in Devon called Wildwood Esco, we're taking over a country estate. We're starting to rewild that. They've already done some good work with um, the chap who owned the estate. And we're looking to expand to new sites. So our model is basically the Wildfire and Wetlands Trust model. I'm just copying Peter Scott. Mm -hmm. So, no, okay. Our future, we want to get <coughs> even more into rewilding. There's good things happening with beaver reintroductions. Um, hopefully the law will be changed in a few months so that beaver are and it's an extreme of beaver. Why why we talk so that? I'm supposed to say that for that's what we say. Um, wild grazing projects, rewilding up the nature reserves, we're trying to do that with a few people, rewilding Britain and others, to set up some big rewilding up and projects in Wales and other places. Pine martens and re red squirrels. We will talk about those we've got a big Surrey's got a big place to play with that one. Um, policy advice is my area. I, I'm nerdy, I get into economics, and I'm glad you said economics is my real interest these days. Why do we have so wildlife? Uh, we're trying to raise funds to build the University of Rewilding in Kent, and that's the residential education centre, both for children and adults, to come on our courses. We already run some courses, some of you have probably been on them. We want to really gratify up in the future, spend a lot more money having residential courses, having the best speakers and allowing people to go do more in-depth, hand-on stuff. And as I said, I want to create a lot more rewilding.
normally um, wildwood or so what is wild it, 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 it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people it's something popularized George Monbiot mostly is popularized essentially I like to say it, it's getting animals to make reserve wardens or donors that's what the wild is mm -hmm. it's about understanding why animals just normal ecology why some animals create space or other tasteful species whatever but as you start unpeeling that only you start getting the complex ecological relationships. Um, water balls and mink are not us. Water balls, mink, and the habitat. There's plenty of habitats where you could have thousands of mink, thousands of water balls. Why is that? Why is some of the areas in Britain got the highest density of water balls also got high densities of mink? And yet other areas have got high densities of mink and no water balls. There's something going on, isn't there? And that needs to be, un you need to start unpeeling that onion that's really the land. What is the land? The shape of the land, the vegetation, all that kind of stuff. The way I like to get into this, because I was obviously a high fly in the Wildlife Trust for a while, is maximizing biodiversity and minimizing the cost of creating that biodiversity. That, to me, is essentially the one. How do we spend as little money as possible have the maximum biodiversity of whatever complex biodiversity metric you care to ascertain or, or look. That essentially is what we want. More wildlife, less cost to either wildlife charities or the taxpayer. And that is the essence of real wild. We've got habitat formation and the complex ecology. How do you get habitat to create itself and the deep ecological links between different Animals, you've got the keystone herbivores, you've got the trophic cascades, as they call it. So, when you introduce an animal into an area, what happens to the rest of it? And the thing that's all popularized that is the wolf and beavers and rivers um, speech on the TED by George Monbiot and introduced that concept of trophic cascades. And you can see in reverse a lot of wildlife destruction is because we're taking out layers of the trophic levels in a habitat, and as you remove those layers, so you have claps of biodiversity. Reintroductions is what everybody likes to focus on. Are we going to reintroduce a wolf? Are we going to uh, reintroduce a lynx? All that kind of stuff. But really, you've got to look at rewilding isn't going to be the elephant trudging through Guildford High Street, and um, that's inappropriate. But what level? of rewilding is appropriate to areas. How can we look to let nature fix itself by picking the right things to do at different areas? What can we do here, there, that allows one animal or some other natural process to let biodiversity come back and enhance things? That, to me, is, is how we pick from the smorgasbord of rewilding, how we can use it so, the connect points. Why do we, 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 one of our first projects after the beavers was the uh, connect pony. That's got the last genes of the tar pan. And this was taken in West Bleed and Thornton Woods a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And that was all, um, it was all Corsican pine and Western hemlock plantation wood. Kent Wildlife Trust have removed that. It's really fantastic. In fact, it, it's taken a long time. I was still working at Kent Wildlife Trust on this project. I've started. That's how long this for has taken. And then the, the horses in a very low level, isn't that 12? And it's 3,500 inches, you know? But it's been compartmentalized, 300 inches compartments. There's a few cows come in. And if you get the right grazing, very low pressure. And you manage your animals, you don't get overgrazing. You can have a much more diverse restoration of that habitat. So that's one element of the wild. So the nibbling of the horses or the other animals gives you a much more diverse restoration and gives you much more biodiversity than if you left it alone or had too much grazing or one type of grazing. Horses do one thing, but that 
Of course, we can't reintroduce wolves there, so we have to be the wolves. And there's some more lovely pictures of the Connick Pawleys, and that's on our site. It's at Orny, it's less than a mile from the centre of the country. And it's a white um, hall meadow, and those animals have done a nice little job there, and they can do it. We've got them, oh, I'm trying to think, we've got them on ooh, 27 inch reserves across the country now, from Scotland to Wales. All over. And the reason why the horses are so good is they just fire and forget. They, they don't need much weapon care. They can survive in wet areas where most of the um, feral ponies we get today don't survive very well. They don't take much weight. It's simple as that. Less money, more, better management for nature reserves. Our friends, the little beavers, <laughs> the most important case of the animal in the whole of the um, not so good if you're down in the southern hemisphere, a few problems down there in Argentina. But in the western hemisphere, beavers probably affect 20 to 25 percent of the whole land surface of Eurasia and North America. If you go back in history, they were central to the wetlands of everything we do. If you want to save water voles, what's the simplest, cheapest, easiest thing you can do? Release some beavers. But what's beavers going to do? They go in big streams, they'll go in and challenge the rivers, create wetlands. They'll create olive they'll create um, complex reed beds. And what sort of habitat can waterfalls survive in and avoid predation? Is it olive cow and reed bed? Yeah. So the best way to solve it, you'll also have other effects. When I first, as a very young chap, that's not been 25 years ago. I was reading a paper on otters, it was in otter conservation, and it was a translation of a Russian paper, just as the Berlin Wall came down and started translating a lot of their scientific papers. Fantastic paper, because I was a nerdy stats model guy, looking at how on rivers with beaver present, you have twice the density, twice the density of otters than you ever did on similar sort of rivers where you did have. Why is that? Well, beavers create all the um, requirements for um, not, um, you know, little mollusks and things like that, which forms most of the um, food in um, otters. Otters, only about 20% of their diet is fish. It's mostly um, little snails, crayfish, and whatever. And it's beavers create all the graduate habitats that allow those creatures to survive to have food, to have nurseries, the whole ecosystem. And we've seen that in study after study recently, bat species. You get twice as many bat species in areas with beavers, habitat for habitat like, than you don't get beavers. Fantastic published study on that one. There's so many studies now that show where you have beavers, you have vastly more wildlife. And it didn't cost all you have to do, beaver, <laughs> a bit like that. That's all you have to do. Fire and forget conservation principles. So, not so simple. If I told you the political shenanigans we have had to all meeting with ministers, um, Queen's councils, lawyers to get the beavers into this country, you wouldn't be convinced it would take a lot of muscle and a lot of effort. And, you know, just getting the license for a half bent trial was amazingly complicated. A real backer. Tiny mm -hmm. The Surrey Specialist. Where's the best place to release pine martins in England? Mm -hmm. Surrey. Surrey. Oh, yeah. yeah, of course it's going to be Surrey. <laughs> Surrey, Sussex, best quality of the interconnected woodland habitat, probably. So, but there's other sites across the south. We want to uh, release pine martens across um, the south of England, from Kent all the way through to Devon. And we've been working on that a long, long time. It's complicated to get the donor population. And we've been working on breeding our own pine martens. Very hard. And we were, we're nearly there with that. Um, and of course, there's some wildlife trust have already done it with us. They're going to do it in the uh, forest of Dean. And 
we've got about five sites we want to release them. It'll take about 10 years to do it. We want to release about four or five pine marbles in each site each and every year for 10 years. And that's the best way to do it. So pine marbles can give us a number of things. Yes, they're lovely animals. They do impact the deep love dormouse. Not them, but they will. A um, few ground nesting birds. But overall, they're not a keystone species. There's a different reason. Not they are a keystone species in a different kind of way because they have their own trophic cascade, even though they're not pop. First off, the first thing we want to do is work with wildlife trusts and natural England to create pine mountain corridors to look at connecting habitats and use this as a flagship project. But the real, real benefit of pine mountains is this little fellow. Because if any of you have been reading uh, Dr. Sheehy's work in the why is it that when you get pine mountains, guess what else you get? Rats. And uh, Dr. Sheehy's work and others We've been working with the University of Wexford, although Dr. Shu is an Aberdeen now. Um, looking at um, sticky traps for hair sampling for market capture population studies and other things like that. But essentially in Central Ireland, in the Midlands of Ireland as they call it, you had a population that had a very high risk of population, 80 to 90 percent, um, but still stood reds. When in the in the 80s and 90s, when we, when pine marten persecution was reduced, the pine marten population was evaporated, and the population of grays, reds, within 10 years, did that. And you've got to think, why is that? What is this amazing, rewilding thing? What is this troph well, trophic cascade? But as you unpeel that ecological relationship, we see it's not because pine marten and we were doing some studies at the moment um, assaying scats, so we can go back and give a quantitative assay of all scats. Very clever, it's very technical just to do. But the pine marten changes behavior. And this is the thing with why wolves and lynx and others, it's not so much that the pine marten eats gray squirrels, they completely change their behavior. Gray squirrels can't evade predation as easy. So they have to modify their behavior strongly, and that makes them unable to compete with red squirrels. Simple as that. So red squirrels, they're pretty good at evading capture. So healthy red squirrels don't really get quite predated by pine marbles. They're quite happy to sit around. And so they don't have to lose as much foraging time as gray squirrels. And that's the real reason. It's behavioral change. Let's talk about a, another rewilding candidate, the, the wild cat, the British wild cat, not the Scottish wild cat, the British wild cat, persecuted and killed throughout the country. And everybody wants to talk at the moment, there's lots of people in Scotland, because they are going to go extinct if we don't do anything. They really are going to go extinct. Um, but we're not addressing why they're going extinct. What we're really talking about, lots of people talk about hybridization. If I was into conservation genetics, it was one of my big things. If you look, read all the papers on this in Europe about European wildcats, see it. Then you can see it's where you get changes in habitat that you get hybridization. Where you get good habitat, remember they're forest creatures. They're not moonland creatures, they're forest creatures. They can live at four times the density of woodland that they can on what we call our wilderness in this country, but it's not. Sheep wrecked, hideous man made habitat. It's not natural habitat. So these creatures are going because we destroy the habitat, as well as persecuting them. And the only way we're going to save these creatures is if we have that habitat back. So we can save it in Scotland if we have the Caledonian habitat back. But to get that, you have to get the sheep off the hills and the deer off the hills, which are at stupidly high concentration. If you go into the highlands of Scotland, if you understand ecology, you just want to cry. Because all the soil is bare, it's all been eroded, there's no hills, and why is that? Sheep and deer. And then start unpeeling that onion. Why really is that? It's because we as taxpayers, in land on us, put sheep and deer on those hills. It's not economic, they couldn't do it if there was no subsidy. 
solely because our taxes, taken from our pocket, are being given to millionaire landowners to stick more animals on the hills. But deer can be both good and bad. Deer can help ecology if they're the right concentration, but if there are too many of them, they will come. And there are parts, not really, if there are a few parts of Surrey, but as you go down to Sussex, there's some real problems with overpopulation of deer, causing the whole of um, the understory to be eaten out. And um, what would solve that problem around here? This fellow. <laughs> The European lynx used to live here, obviously, you know, 1,300 years ago. It was a long time, but probably up north, because they live at lower densities. Yeah, it could be 800, 900 years ago when they went next day. Lynx don't have human beings. There's not one record of a lynx attack from a child or a human. So, why can't we have them back? We know that they, they will take the occasional sheep. Very small numbers, probably far less than domestic dogs. Why is it that we can't have something like this? And I think the real reason is if you analyze the economics of the situation, is links will make the profit of sheep rearing much less because they will work in the sheep. The sheep will have less offspring. They'll be more cautious of grazing. They will change their behavior. Even though links don't really come out of woodland habitats, they're very much shadows of the woodland, you don't see them much. And you also can see there's other ecological relationships, like where you get lynx, they will actually um, suppress fox populations. So those foxes that take the odd lamb will be less. So on balance, we probably wouldn't have any more sheep taken. The economic cost of farmers will be minuscule when you look at somebody buying a nature reserve or English nature spending a few quid on some program, the compensation cost would be utterly minuscule. Yet the benefit they would bring to the whole country of just having the odd links here and there would be fantastic for habitat regeneration. It would solve a lot of your problems with uh, things like wildcats, all kinds of uh, upland species, um, both small mammals, birds, insects, humans. You'd have a much more diverse habitat where you have links. Now we've got the bad boy. <laughs> and unfortunately, the links don't really do too much of red deer. They can touch red deer. But they've got other complications. Having the wolf back, and from where we stand, if I get my bearings, I think in that direction, if we go about 300 miles, guess what we'll find? One of these. They're that close Yes, they cause problems, but it's only to a tiny few people who can attack any humans. The last human death I think, was 19 years ago. And a lot of those, there's a reason why wolves attack humans. That's to do with hunting and stuff like that. Very, very rarely is there any. Um, the, the evolution of the wolf, the coevolution of the wolf with man is a fascinating subject. I haven't got time to go into it again. Um, but the wolf is very much. A, a, could have an amazing fact, impact on certain areas of Britain if we could have real national parks back, if we could have some land that actually would be just wild and for humans. So I've looked at some of these very quick um, ideas of rewilding. <clears throat> but how do you make rewilding, what, what other benefits has got rewilding? So one thing we can look at is ecosystem services, as people call them these days. How can rewilding actually benefit humans? Because it has lots of benefits. In rewilding, we can see that flooding, rewilding will, will more than pay for itself, just in the savings we'll have from public flood um, Rewilding uplands, rewilding floodplains, will absorb it all by water, and it will be less coming through towns. The money we save in that will be more than enough to compensate the people who use that from the wild in other places. Because the areas saved are very expensive areas, and the areas used are very inexpensive areas of land. So the cost benefits are huge. And even in drought, a lot of the problems you've got around here, you've got very low water levels in the summer. Guess what beavers along rivers do? They buffer. They don't just stop the high flows. 
they increase the load flows of all the water seems to add more of them and the wilded wetlands and it slowly keeps river levels much higher. That's why we've got so little water about rivers. We've been uh, taking it up ground, but it's also there's nothing there's nothing sponging and holding onto the water as it goes through the whole catchment. And that's what beavers really want to do. And quality of water. A beaver system will do immense uh, good in removing silt, sediments, removing pollution, nitrates, phosphates, all those little reed beds along rivers and put them as you breed channels, as you create. You won't get that many dams with beavers, just in upper catchments. As you go down rivers, all those little summit wetlands, just utterly sucking nitrates, phosphates, and mobilized pollutants, takes out all the sediments, and you'll have a lot of very nice, clean running rivers, which will help get otters back. Get the otters back, no me. <laughs> Where you have most of the reductions in maintenance in England have been pretty much down to whichever waters. So, and, and what's, what's the best thing in the world to get rid of me? You try trapping me, it's hard work. Otter in the rivers? No me. Otters don't like me. In fact, you can go even further and start talking about, look at all the invasive species we've got in this country, but look at where they live. Look at the wildcat, and what I said before about uh, feralized um, cats. If you have pristine habitat, the wildcat totally outcompetes ferals and hybrids, and they won't breed. So, in pristine habitat, you can extend that thought, that rewilding thought, to lots of habitats. Why do we have signal crayfish? Because the streams aren't good enough to have um, white tall crayfish. You know, you can extend it to many ways. Invasive plants are coming in areas that have been disturbed, that are now so optimal for the native species of this country. And if you want to stop invasive creatures, have better quality habitat. Then our own species will like compete with the invasive species. It's as simple as that. You can look at that. Air quality, um, lots of rewilding trees. Stop thinking about habitats just as a bit of grassland and other things. We need dwarf scrub habitats. Um, sucks in, helps clean up air quality. Not brilliantly, but pretty good. Carbon and global warming is really interesting. I've been doing some studies um, with, um, I'll get the name right, uh, Bangor University on the carbon sequestration rates of what beavers are. And my own models tell me that if you start, if you have beavers on 20% of the waterways from the UK, it would absorb about 700. Over the next, it would, it, over the space of 100 years, as the beaver levels went up, dynamic model, it would increase this carbon sequestration into those wetlands more than what human carbon is produced in the UK. Now that sounds a massive thing, but when you look at where carbon is being produced at the moment, one of the things we don't understand is land changes, the drainage of land, changes of land use, have released a massive amount of carbon, probably as much, if not more, than all of the fossil fuels we've used. Fossil fuels we've used. It's something that's not being modelled well, and there is starting to become a bit modelling in that. And as we drain land, as we change it, don't understand, there's far more carbon in our soils than there is in the upper surface of the sea, and way more than what's recycled through the atmosphere. Carbon stores in the soils is absolutely gigantic amounts, and we've been releasing gigaton after gigaton after gigaton from our soils oxidization. Beavers reverse that process, suck it all back in. So it's something we can really make a change with changes in land. Um, also to do with future economic well-being. We rely on nature for all of these ecosystem services for human health. If we don't start thinking about it properly, we are impoverishing our children and our grandchildren. And that's what rewilding is. It's a zero-cost solution. It doesn't take any taxpayers' money. It doesn't take any charity money to do rewilding. 
all it does is we have to start using land efficiently and put enough land over to nature and let nature get on with it. Um, you know, it would take me and a team of 20 people with a few white vans to completely rewild this country in 10 years if I was given the chance. <laughs> Now, how much is that? I'm pretty cheap. I don't cost that much money. Do it for free. And there's plenty of people who will give us the cash to do it. That's all it would take. But first, we have to address the fundamental, some of the fundamental problems and understand what the fundamental problems to rewilding and nature conservation. A lot of the problems is, um, to be quite frank, we don't understand enough about nature. And I'm even talking about even professional nature conservationists. We don't really understand about ecology. It's a complex beast. I spent half of my life trying to understand it, and I know a tiny, tiny amount. And I probably read three scientific papers a week on ecology, and I'm pretty bright at that. I've got five degrees, and you know, every time I take an IQ test, it normally gets on about 190. And I'm still stupid. I don't understand anything I need to. I really don't, because it's a complex beast. And we need to get more knowledge. There's also the old shifting baseline thing that Mongols show that we don't understand what nature is. We think nature, you know, seeing this little stream, but we don't understand what was there a generation ago, two generations ago, a hundred generations ago. We've lost an understanding of what really is nature. Nature is not trying to recreate an 18th century farm. As much as it's nice to say the old orchid, that is not a really strong divide in this place. We need to get deeper understanding. Go to the Bella Visa Pushka, right? Then you understand what nature is. Then you can come back and reassess what you think should be nature is. That's what I say. Go and see what nature truly is in an untamed state. See, I've just given you permission to go and to go for a nice trip to Poland or Belarus, it's the nicest place in Europe. We've got to really understand that for nature to flourish, it has to have a place to flourish, and that means land. <clears throat> land, land, land. It's the only thing. We need more land for nature. We've got to understand how our whole society, both legal and economic systems, are all contained perverse incentives that make humans always choose to destroy nature and not look after nature. And it's in everything we do, we have a stupid economic system it's been corrupted. The, 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 to, I've spent over 10 years trying to understand economics. I've met some of the finest economists in the world. I've read all the books. I've joined all kinds of economic forums. I've even just finished writing a book myself, which will be published in a couple of months. And somebody paid me to do it. <laughs> and I'm dyslexic, so I don't know. I keep writing. It was been uh, six months of hell. But the corruption of economics is deeply, and if you actually start reading economics, and I mean really reading the finest economic minds, when I've gone through every great economic textbook, they actually talk a lot about the stuff that I've learned. The trouble is it's forgotten about. It's pushed from the car, it's taken away. Because human greed wants to have a free lunch. Human greed wants to, to destroy nature, to use monopolies, to get money for no work. And that's, that's the real issue I've understood. Is, and even the guy who invented the concept of GDP, Fisher, he, he, when he set it up, he said, OK, that's OK for the war economy. But once the war economy finishes, we have to put in deple depletion and dilapidation. But nobody wanted to do that after the war finished. Because depletion was depletion of natural resources. Depletion of land should be actually factored into the GDP. Figures. And dilapidation is when things fall apart, right? But that was that would have made the most negative content, right? So it's all gonna be so when we look at GDP, <coughs> GDP is much as a measure of how we destroy nature and how we mix stuff up other people than it is a measure of our own economic success. And there's loads of little things. Even the guy who got into the tragedy of the commons, he said it, it's not the tragedy of the commons, it's the tragedy of the unmanaged commons. Right? We've well, got managed commons, managed common property, managed land. You don't get the problem with the tragedy of the commons. And now we've got the tragedy of the commons, where everything is private, nearly all the land is private, and everybody's trying to exploit it for their own economic gain, which means destroying the nature. And there's no problem, it's 
organization. There's no, you know, the law is very poor in stopping people abusing nature. You should really make it, if they destroy nature, it should cost them in their pockets. So, the kind of things we need to make a flourishing world, we need to start understanding some basic things like practical rewilding skills, the kind of skills we need to actually create rewilding places. We need to have spatial planning in this country where we decide, you know, we're going to have some land for nature, just like the Dutch try to do. And we need to join it all together. We need a nature grid. We need island biogeography modeling. We need population modeling. I mean, you know, we're all talking about modeling. Why is it natural England doing this? Why is some other countries? Yeah? You know, I mean, no offense to you guys, but you there, you're not slaving away doing all this stuff. Surely we should have a national plan for actually understanding the health of nature. And it's pretty rubbish compared to other countries. And it's, it, we, they naturally can spend a lot of money, but it doesn't seem to come out with some really good stats on these issues. Homes are wildlife. Um, homes take up about 4% of the UK, where the natural environment is about. In fact, in England, there's more land available for golf courses than there are for homes. So the idea that we're going to not allow people to have homes for wildlife, well, you can have everybody can have a house and we have loads of wildlife. Food or wildlife, it's another one. NFU's little people going to tell us food security, food security, food security. Well, 40% of the land of the UK actually costs subsidy to farm it and produces a tiny fraction of what we eat. We also waste a vast amount of money on food. We export um, as many calories as we import. We probably make about 20 times as many calories as actually we need to eat. So there's more than enough food to feed everybody, have a massive margin of safety, and have huge rewilding. We easily rewild 50% of the UK, still feed ourselves perfectly, still house ourselves perfectly. Because a lot of the land that's used at the moment for semi-agriculture is just, it's, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Um, uplands is the place to rewild. Floodplains are the place to rewild. Coastal buffer strips are the place to rewild. All of that will save us all money. We'll be richer society, we'll have more jobs, and we'll have more work. Because taxing people, other people to give money to people to create jobs actually is a very inefficient process. You're much better off doing it. Now, it's not very nice for those landowners who you know, are living on state support, but lots of people have to live on state support. Do we have to go subsidizing people to destroy wildlife? I don't think we should. And the perverse incentives we talked about, agricultural subsidies, <coughs> even agri-environment schemes. And this is the thing, once you start really understanding, you start understanding, I've been campaigning for many years for actually destroying wildlife. How, do agri how is giving money to people to protect wildlife, and the wildlife trusts get it, many farmers get it, to be a bit nicer to wildlife, how does that destroy wildlife? Because when you start understanding economics like any modeling exercise, you have to see all the effects of an activity, not just the individual. I can give Surrey Wildlife Trust, the big agri-environment agri money, to protect some wildlife and they'll do a good job. But when you understand that all of that money going into farming is actually creating more areas of farming. Some land would have come out of production because it wasn't worth to be farmed. But when we give an agri, but when we give an agri environment scheme, that land does become. It's now economic to farm it. And the farmed environment, even under an agri environment scheme, has probably got a lot less, four to twelve times less biodiversity than if we just leave it alone. And that's a really hard pill to swallow. To so understand that even our so-called agri-environment schemes are actually, when you understand economics, destroying nature in aggregate. But wildlife trusts, or SPV, woodland trusts, or pocketing the cash, they're not going to understand that we need to get rid of agri-environment schemes. We need to get rid of all forms of land subsidy. It's madness. Economically. It's robbing the poor to feed the rich, robbing the poor to kill the Tax dodge is the same thing. Land's now very expensive, you can't afford to get it. 
mostly because people are using land for tax dodge. So all, all the, you've seen all the Panama Papers. It's all about land ownership, transferring land, keeping land, um, all the overseas, all in shell companies. And that causes land values to increase, like rentals to increase, and stocks is getting involved with the wildlife. It also gives an economic incentive to people to buy land and then often use it inefficiently. Well, you perhaps the state is doing whatever. Yeah? And um, tax allowances, another man economic idea. Tax allowances for both farmers means you can buy more machinery, but you can't afford to employ somebody to look after a bit of land because it's always more beneficial to buy a bit of kit because that bit of kit you buy, you can knock off the taxes you've got to pay. Well, if you employ a human being, you can't knock right off your taxes, but you can also, it's to do with five-year subsidy things, but also you now have to pay national insurance and employment taxes, both for the individual has to pay them and the employer. So having taxes on wages and national insurance stops getting people involved in jobs in the countryside where we could actually farm the land less intensively than having a 300 grand four-wheel tra tractor pulling something over it. Even though both would be the same economic efficiency. I'm not talking hippie cloud cuckoo land, I'm talking real economics. So if we shifted that tax allowance system, got rid of tax allowances for agriculture and for businesses. See, if I'm a business, do I want to pay somebody to fix my computer? Or do I want to buy a new one? Pay somebody? Buying a new computer, I'm going to pay that in tax anyway, I'm not going to have any problems. There's a huge subsidy to always buy new and not fix, to always abuse, use natural resources, buy more pesticides, and not use people to solve problems. So that's the externalities, that's the economist's way of talking when we damage other things. If we damage other people, by polluting, by taking something away, we're robbing both our children and each other. And that means we shouldn't allow people to get rid of externalities. We should be charging people. If they abuse nature, if they abuse each other, they should have to pony up. And that's what we should base our whole taxation on. We should forget about the taxation of labor and true capital. That's where somebody invests money for a good purpose. And we should only tax things that damage. Things like when we take land, we own, we take that away from other people. Yeah, in perpetuity, we all need land. We all need natural resources. We didn't create them. You didn't create the land. Why should you? You can have a right to occupy that land, but you can't really own the land. It's created by nature. Sunshine, water. It's all created by nature. If you purify water, that becomes true capital because it puts a process in it that makes it value. So, but we shouldn't tax true capital, only tax monopolies of one sort or another and um, things that we, we destroy, push, all that kind of stuff. So this comes to one of the fundamental problems. If you start unpeeling all these onions, onions that I've done in my career about trying to understand the ecology of nature and the processes of solving nature reserves, um, getting more biodiversity back for less money, how do we actually achieve it? What are the practical remedies that come up? The first is, we need to be, everybody in nature conservation needs to be talking about the efficient use of land. And that land below the margin of production, that means where land isn't economic to use, where we have to subsidize it in some way, should essentially be left wild. Very simple. If we did that, You'd have more natural land that you should stay out. Probably 40 to 50 percent of the UK. Because it's just not worth it. We need real national parks. Because at the moment, our national parks are not national parks. International classification does not say they're national parks. A national park should be owned by the state and should be a true national park. It shouldn't just be planning guidance that you can't build an extension to your house. Because that's essentially what national parks are. Right? It's outrageous that we have so-called, they're not national <coughs> parks. They're hideous. And they don't have, have no more wildlife in your back garden. Most national parks have got. And you think I jest, but I don't think they have. I really don't. 
Um, and we need a nature grid. We need a designated nature grid, just like Holland and others, where we can actually start allowing populations to move from one place to another. We need economic rent and externalities as government revenue, pay for what you receive, pay for what you take. Um, the other interesting thing is the, the sort of the amazing guy called um, Henry George, who argued with Malthus a long time ago about population. This is the other thing people throw is we've got too many people. And it's true, there's far too many humans. But why do human populations expand? And why do they contrast? And even if you into a small mammal population, you can actually do some fascinating studies where you look at group selection and individual selection. There are many group selection events where constrained resources, means populations of animals, will actually constrain the grid. And humans can do that. Under certain conditions, human beings prove time and time again, and this is what Henry George said in 1870, arguing against the Malthusian idea that our human population is always going to expand and destroy the world. He saw that when you had the rules of the game set right, in certain societies, you get stable human population. Don't increase, in fact, the number of populations is increasing. But that's where you've got good education. You've got the rules of the game that are thick. You've got good quality uh, policing and no crime. And everybody lives without too much economic disparity. And if you have those factors in, and that's what all these other things will do. Having a land value tax, having natural resource taxes, will actually suck out most of the wealth of the rich. Where do you think they get the money? They didn't work for it. They're getting it because they own a resource that they can charge rent to everybody else to get access to. That's why they're rich. It's land, you know, you look at, um, you look at all of the issues. It's not the uh, super entrepreneurs, it's people who own a monopoly that get rich. That's why we've got, and this, you know, house prices where poor people can't afford houses. That's just because of the way a monopoly always absorbs all the cash of everybody around. So, if we have the rules of the game right, and we have these economic systems that grip fairness, and have good quality things, and protect loads of nature, that will stop the Malthusian nightmare of human populations going up forever. And we can actually moderate our population, just like in many cases nature. I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> Dave. Yeah, the national parks we've got now, do you think they're well cared for enough? You know? No, I think they're a fork fork in polar. They're a joke. They've got, uh, they've got mages there with cows that stop you from lighting fires and doing things. And but it's not lighting fires, it's because you've got sheep farmers on the yeah, yeah, national yeah, parks. Yeah. It's got now to do with lighting fires. Um, it's all to do, in fact, you want your national parks to have loads of campers and other things, but you just need to kick all the sheep farmers off and all the economic centres to have sheep farming and others. You just need to stop farming in national parks, leave the land alone, let it rewild, and then you can have tons of people camping and, you know, going on. And you'll actually probably end up generating more cash for the local inhabitants through um, greater tourism. You can still have towns in national parks, and people to access it, and many national parks do have centres of population, of population, industry, and others. It's just about that efficiency of land use, where people are, are kind of held into the villages and towns on the periphery, and then you can still use it as a, a recreational resource. All you need to do is just kick all the sheep off. And the problem solved. The national parks weren't set up as nature conservation sites anyway. There was, there was elements of them. It, 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 there's lots of political elements going through national parks, uh, right to roams and other things like that. When I'm talking about national parks, I'm talking about the nationally recognised idea of what a national park is, that is subscribed to many of the countries that we then go and try and lecture to save wildlife while we've destroyed all our own. I mean, how do you think most foreign people look at Britain when we go over there and say, stop chopping down the... Um, stop planting all that palm oil plantation and killing the, um, the orangutans, 
when we've absolutely mullered our wildlife and we've got no program for bringing it back. Do you not think that people over in, um, in uh, different countries look at upon us and think, it's a joke, you've completely killed all your wildlife, you've got that's a relic of natural habitat. Why should we listen to you? Most um, woodland managers take Dover within for the first time. The first thing they will generally do in that prescription is say we need to thin the woodland and reintroduce coppice in. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a good ecosystem unless you do that. But what, what's your role to that? Shifting baseline hypothesis. We perceive that coppice woodland has certain biodiversity in it, which it does. We know that a, a complex structure of woodland habitats is great for different biodiversity. The problem is, is, if you go to the Lavisa Pushka and you've got somewhere that's got no guy with a chainsaw, yet has vastly more biodiversity per acre than any woodland we've got in this country. And that's because it takes time for nature to restore itself. You need your wizard back. You need a few other creatures to occasionally move through the woodland. You need to restore the complex mycorrhizal fungi and all the different species to become the pushka, the wildwood, yeah? And you're not going to get that just by a hair hanging fire. And if you don't cut this, you're going to, you know, use your nightly gear or some flower. Mm -hmm. But that's what we need to do if we're going to have real wildlife back, genuine, that's the fucking adversity. You need to learn. You need to learn. It's, it's basically, unfortunately, you need 20 years of ecological study that probably, you know, equates to about three PhDs start growing all this information, or you need to be around people who understand it. And that's what we've lost in most of our woodland management. So I, I've started up as a young conservationist writing management plans, doing phase one habitat surveys, and um, it was all stupid. Uh, because something I can sit in an office and write isn't what the real world is, and I don't have the knowledge to understand. And yet it always seems to be the young chaps that get the job to write the management plans. Um, management plans are judged, you don't know. But we need more land. And we need to have faith that if you start a process, nature can look out of it. We need to lose the dominionist viewpoint that man tells nature of land what to do. That's really what we need to lose. This idea that we, with our tiny little minds, with so narrow a perception, can actually tell nature what to do. I think, I think there is a problem, to a certain extent, though, which a lot of people who put forward rewilding, and you just, in your language, you just um, sort of included it because you said man and nature. And people forget that actually man is part of nature. And what we do is just as natural as a beaver engineering a habitat or an otter engineering a habitat. It's just we've got out of control, you know. Well, have we got out of control? Maybe we, maybe, maybe we haven't. We're still natural. We're still part of evolution. We're still, we haven't lost that ability to suddenly um, lose our, you know, suddenly be um, culled by bacteria or whatever. So, and I think I think that's the problem. Sometimes we look at nature and we go, that's over there, and we shouldn't include ourselves as part of that. But I, 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 I. I Philosophically, I have a problem with that. I'm not mm. saying, and, and somehow we have to, we have to, we have to regard our, ourselves as part of the ecology. Let me turn that around <clears throat> because I look at it from an economic argument. Yes, as well. It's, it's, it's still actually with that argument. Mm -hmm. Most humans in this country have got no bearing on what happens to the land. Mm -hmm. We've got no say, and. We're all hemmed in small areas, and most land, vast majority of land, about 70% of land, is owned by 3,000 families, all sent from our Norman conquerors. They decide what happens on it, they're subsidised. We've got no interrelationship with nature. Under the kind of economic system that we have here, land would become uber cheap. In fact, it's actually worthless. If you take the rent of land, that land becomes expensive to own unless you do something to pay for it. Um, 
So we all have land that we could use, either where we work and then for ourselves, and we'd have a lot more people working on the land because there'd be more money coming to individuals working on that. So we have a much more interrelationship with the land itself. And when you start getting people, you know, going on my granddad's market garden when I was a kid, yeah, it was a market garden, but there was more wildlife in that market garden than any before in farmer's field. And you start getting a feel for that. So you have more people returning to the land, understanding nature. And that's what we have. We've herded all the humans off the land, the Enclosures Act, you know, three, four, five hundred years, there's been a slow process of making the mass of humanity separate from nature. And returning people to nature means you need more democratic control of what happens to the land in this country. People need to work for the land, be part of the land, and get a feel for what land. So that's the way I've come to it. Yes, we are part of nature, but most of us are herded on a tiny percentage. Remember, most of us are on a tiny percentage of land. The water bowl's not going, if you do look your water bowl back, some of your best water bowls there are actually heavy built up areas. Eh? What? Why is that? That's because the natural areas are so intensively farmed. There's nothing left. The, the rivers are all penalized. The farmers are farming right up to the riverbanks. They've lost all the wetlands. They've damned, they've changed. That's why we're losing the water for us. It's not urban development. It's not urban pollution anymore. It used to be once upon a time. It was devastating. But not anymore. It's farming. And it's how we farm that land, the inefficient way. There's nobody working on the farms anymore. Yeah, you know, there's a couple of kids on um, um, minimum wage, driving a million and a half quid combine harvester. That's the world. You've got farm management companies managing 3,000 acres of land with four employees. And they're all on minimum wage, apart from a couple of farm managers who really know what they're doing. You know, they're all clever guys, but they're getting all their information from the farm from the, um, the fertilizer companies, and it's all to a little you know, computer management plan. And it's all based on the fact that they're not paying for the damage they do. So I think humans should be part of nature. We've certainly seen it. Uh, there's some fantastic examples of like the, uh, the First Nation people of um, Yellowstone Park, how taking those people have changed nature. Look at um, the um, Kenya. The, um, the mass side. And those human beings had a complex relationship. If you start studying the history of, of um, uh, people and how they interrelated with the outside world, we've had the most devastating change in 100,000 years ago, never mind 20,000 years ago, never mind in the last 200 years. There's been a constant change of human beings are part of the life. Mm. So just, just to, to kind of work on that a little bit, I mean, you raised the issue of coppicing. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are, there are certain sort of pledge climax communities that are highly valued, mm -hmm. uh, heathland. If you leave it alone, what happens to it? Well, you can have to rewild it with heathland. Well, you just need a few horses and other animals at the right grazing. And what you want is to have enough land to have... You see, heathland was never a continuous place. It was parts of a woodland. Of of course, but it, I mean that's that's just one, right? Heathland. So there, there are there are lots of other communities um, which which currently rely on management. Yeah. Um, so when not, I'm not saying. Well, have, 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 wait. Uh, the, the thing the thing is, what we're not talking about is 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 just is is just leaving them suddenly. You're going to have to you're going to have to create a mosaic. Aren't you? You're going to have to, and you're going to have to have a, a step change where these uh, the creatures that are dependent on these areas are maintained through management. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what's perhaps needed is is, is um, perhaps a more a more mixed approach where you you do consider rewilding in in many areas, but you also do work to maintain these uh, these. Um, areas that rely on management. Well, it's when I said you pick the right bit of rewilding you need. Mm. We're not talking about sending the elephants in yet, are we? Right? <laughs> and, and if you read some of the criticisms of rewilding, elephants are unique. They, they lived in this country until we killed them, but 
some time ago, mm -hmm. and many of the plants communities we have today actually adapted to live in, in elephant raised areas. But you're not going to send them in. Um, it's not going to work. You have to see how rewilding for each in case that you can look at can help reduce the cost of the management of your heathland mm -hmm. and increase its biodiversity. But having just the idea that we're going to have this heathland mono habitat on 400 acres mm -hmm. is really a stupid idea. You're not maximizing biodiversity and you're creating costs involved. What you can have is look at how do we get that grazing and management of that heath done as cheaply as possible for maximizing the biodiversity potential? And is there any tools of rewilding we can introduce to cut that management costs and to increase the biodiversity of the mm. site? As long as you don't throw the baby out in the bathroom. Well, right? there's no is... baby to throw out because yeah. we can have more biodiversity. You can't manage sites for single species. It's, it's a very inefficient way of managing any site. And heathland is but a transition site, um, type of habitat in a multifaceted habitat. And that's what we really want. We don't want to have bowling green, all mono habitat, even if it's good habitat, you want to have a bit of a rock. Sure, sure. I think you have to face, probably face up to the fact that, that if you are doing the world, then you can't control what you get in the sense of... In the sense of I think in, you will control. Many, as I started to talk, You've got where you're using rewilding, where you take a few elements of rewilding and create that efficiency, and then you have the end result of rewilding, where you could have, you know, multi hundred thousand acre sites that are totally left alone. But that's key, they have to be huge. Because yes, before you can pull out of your smorgasbord approach, to go yeah. back to the Bella Visa Pushka, yes, we need a million acres. Because yeah. rewild, re rewilding in itself has has to have that kind of element of chance, doesn't it? So you put everything in together and then see what happens because chance chance effects like wildfire, for instance, you want that back in the world and system, don't you? Absolutely. To be able to open up areas that would be deep mm. under, you know. And, and, and have a dynamic deep. change to give you enough habitat to have populations of people, exactly. specialists yeah. and other things. Mm. Yeah. But many of these communities have, have shifted and altered dramatically sort of under the management regime. So, um, so for example, let's take brownfield sites, for example. Mm -hmm. Many of these offer unique communities, which are really interesting and special. Um, and uh, the last thing you want to do is to screw those up. I mean, in, in urban areas, this is some of the best biodiversity you've got. And yet it's an entirely artificial um, environment. Talking about these, that's what I like to come to, to economics final solution to rewilding. Mm -hmm. Look at inner city areas, right? We, um, because uh, land use is inefficient, right, we've got a larger area of urban land use than we need. If you actually put a pressure to make urban land use more efficient, you'd have people on less area of land, but you'd lose your brownfield sites. So I'm actually for losing brownfield sites if we can have more efficient use of land for urban things, then you wouldn't have to rely on a few derelict buildings to have unique habitats. You'd have a much greater area to have lots of different wild things on. Now, I know you might lose a, a unique type of habitat there. There would be no you know, limestone rock community or something like that. But overall, you'd end up with more biodiversity. And it's the first thing you have to learn in, in rewilding is to understand that we have to think in aggregate not in the individual. I think the problem with many human beings is they can't think in the aggregate. They have to think in the individual. And the only way to, you have to lose and have faith to start thinking what is the best overall instead of what, you know, I want to see this here now in front of me. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. Most humans find that very hard. I think we're starting to see some real shifts towards elements of rewilding happen anyway, and I think that's happening with, um, particularly on rivers, and the idea is that, you know, there's, <laughs> me, me, me and, uh, and, and my team at the Wildlife Trust and uh, you know, volunteers here go out um, and do 
um, river restoration stuff, and we're we're putting woody debris in rivers. <laughs> and and we were thinking about this actually, um, and I wish I'd done it in April uh, on April the first. I was gonna, <laughs> we were going to go around and make a video of us sort of taking beavers on leads around <laughs> and just kind of chopping down trees like that. It's the chainsaws. You yeah. stand there with a the beaver. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and and. Uh, you know, we, we have got places in, in Surrey, like for instance, there's the wonderful um, MOD sites at the top of the River Way, mm -hmm. in Purbright and, and places like that, um, where we could hold water back by, and, and it's an enclosed site, so you could control beavers going in there, you know, let them go, see what happens. We've already got red deer in there as, as a way of, of doing grazing when we can't do, um, when we can't stick cattle. You can put beavers in there and they create their own little dams and things. It, it will and cause problems, it but it's, it's all about the balance. What is the problem we've got at the moment is who controls, who decides, who benefits. Mm -hmm. And it's always a few individuals benefit and most people lose out. So we all lose a few pounds a year because you've got too much flooding or some problems caused by um, a few people's land use. And we need a method of exchange whereby um, if, if whoever benefits and whoever loses, they have to compensate each other. And that's essentially, if you work it out, what a land value tax would do. Those people who would lose would be, be um, would be compensated because they've got less taxation. And those people who benefited, their land values would go up and they'd afford to pay a little bit more tax. And so it would, it would perfectly balance out winners and losers. And a beautifully efficient simple way. And that's, that's what we need in that system is how can people genuinely pay for what they take from others in nature and then benefit um, from others um, if they benefit and they lose out. So landowners, landowners at the moment it's all win, win, win. If you own land, you're quitting. You've got to learn a lot of money, right? Unless you're a good hearted soul who sells out of their, their own heart to do something about it. Great. There's people who do it. Under a system like that, you, you wouldn't get a chance. To, it would turn even the worst landowner and farmer into the greatest nature conservationist. Because they'd lose if they didn't. That's the beauty. So I, I'm a bit obsessive about the ideas of land value tax. And there's lots of other ways to get more jobs. Fantastic. Because you're not, you're not taxing people who create good things. And, innovate and stuff like that. It perfectly balances free market economics, socialism, uh, environmentalism, all that kind of stuff. It's got it's something for everybody, whether you're a rabid free market lunatic or the deepest socialist. It's the perfect policy. The only people who are going to lose are the people who sit on their bones and do nothing and pledge rents from everybody else for doing nothing, just pulling them or people who hurt the environment. What's not at all? So what, what's your thinking? Do you think this is um, with, with people who are in control of about yeah, well, our destiny? Is this, is this because the, where did the, the where did most of the people who control our destiny, where did they get their money from? Is it because they worked hard? Is it because they're particularly clever and created fantastic things? No, it's because they want land and access to natural resources and are busy trading in it and you know, little political favours to get planning commissions and all that kind of stuff. That's the problem with this policy, is the very few people who, who actually hurt our environment and take uh, monopolistic profits from the rest of us, is they're the ones deciding what our laws are. Winston Churchill tried to change it with the people's, that's what the people's budget was all about, Parliament Act, read your history, number of people have tried to do it. This is policy of Green Party, Liberal Democrats, I give up. Thank you. I give lectures to the Green Party at the conference the day before last. Do quite a few things on political activist groups in environmental um, policy. And remember, we're not talking happy here. This isn't you know people smoking straight cigarettes. This is this is the cleverest economic thought. The finest economists that have ever written or lived share the view of this. It's just hidden away because it doesn't benefit. Um, what measure of biodiversity do you use in assessing the effects of all that? Because, I mean, some of the things that you were talking about, like nice example of heathland, 
that you are at. At the moment, we have a list of species in this country, and we count that list of species to decide levels It would take about 10 hours to Whereas answer the question <laughs> about why... Throw what, that away, because yeah. we get other things. <laughs> the, it would take about 10 hours of complex argument to talk about the problems of biodiversity metrics. It's an area I spent a lot of time. And the common biodiversity metrics that you probably know, shadow climate index and all that, they're just pants. They're not a real measure of <laughs> biodiversity. It's just that's the data you can get a hold of. So you've got to be practical. So there's one way you can be practical and say, we can go measure some species and we can do some fancy stuff, uh, measure some biomass that into a, a good biodiversity metric. And there's a few people wrestled with that problem. Fantastic paper just this week on that very issue on rewilding Britain by um, a, a really good ecologist who's looked at it in Sussex, actually, on bat biodiversity. He's used that to look at grasslands um, with and without birds. Okay? And they came down that all the biodiversity metrics were much better on an area that just wasn't grazing at all, and when you had grazing, although you got an occasional nice orchid or whatever you got, the biodiversity in general was rubbish. But it's, it's what you assign values to. Is a certain amount of uniqueness of one plant or animal, what's the value of that? And as you get more into biodiversity metrics, as you peel those complex biodiversity metric onions, there's, there's lots of other issues. What is the interrelationship? What is the resilience of certain species site. So you're not looking at species turnover, number of species, biomass density, you're now starting to look at resilience and things like that, interconnectedness, what is the potential for the site to increase or decrease biodiversity. Start pulling those factors into biodiversity. Then you start going into deep theoretical stuff. Like my first degree was medical biochemistry and I remember at the age of 19 sitting thinking this very topic while in an organic chemistry and I determined, and I call this Smith's first law, <laughs> that Smith's first law, what is biodiversity? And it is the entropy difference between chemicals that had no biological life and biological life. And the finest metric you could ever use for biodiversity or anything is to do with the difference in energy states between molecules without life and molecules with life. And that, I think, would be the finest um, biodiversity metric. Now, to do that would be virtually impossible. And there's lots of flaws in that, but it would be the perfect biodiversity metric. Also, you'd want to give a time change to that. So the Smith's second law, the definition of evolution, which I was also bored at 19 years old, I came to determine was that evolution is actually the increasing efficiency to turn energy, energy inputs into a system into greater changes in differential energy well, Yeah, and that seems to be one of the biggest problems at the moment. As I say, we measure it in terms of species and biomass, but we don't measure the process. Absolutely. So we, but the energy state would solve that process. Yeah, because our measurement is not allowing for evolution in that context. But the other thing you can do is measure function biodiversity, yes. which is actually a much better expression of how biodiverse, of how ecosystems operate, because you're looking in a complex ecosystem for different functions. So, mm -hmm. in rivers, for instance, you know you're looking for shredders, you're looking for lots of different aquatic invertebrates, and actually the biodiversity element is that element of resilience, isn't it? It is because biodiversity is just the broad spread of how many species you've got doing that particular job. If you've got more species doing it, then your big system The more trophic but levels, if you're going, if you're the going more stable system. Something like heathland, then actually you're changing what mix you would expect yeah. in that habitat. And that's but heathlands aren't a resilient I know, habitat. that's what I mean. But that, if you're going to do that, then you've got to accept that as a measure. Which we don't let's come into the economics of it, right? Say so you're going to have lots of heathland, you're going to spend the money to create heathland, you're going to manage it. Right? The other way to look is the economics of, um, I did an MBA by the way, a few other things. Um, if you then now start to look at, you're sitting there, boss of a wildlife trust, right? And you're going, how do I spend my limited budget to create the maximum biodiversity? Do I do it on a functionally 
more difficult habitat to maintain, or do I look at spreading that money more thinly, but allow different habitats that are more resilient and self-managing? And you'll get more different biodiversity in that way. Because you can't, we don't have a limited pot of money. You've always got to see that we've got, and that's why we started off this lecture by talking about what is rebirthing. It's about saving the maximum amount of wildlife using the fewest resources. And you can't get away from that fact. That is essentially one of the things I think rewilding is. It's about how do we, conservation community, use what little resources we have to protect the maximum number of field voles and other animals. And of course, we've got to balance out what is going to be the animals that are going to be seen. That's a complex one. But overall, we can use whatever biodiversity metrics we like. And it's good to use good biodiversity metrics that understand the complexities of nature. And, and now I always think my brain's too small to actually understand all that anyway. Because <laughs> um, it is. I'm, I'm, I'm just a horrible little organic molecule. You know? And then you start getting into metaphysics and how can you understand things you don't actually understand. Well, that kind of stuff. Um, but yes, so best bang for the buck. That's what we're going to be for. Let's see as much more life for spending as little time and effort and resources. And it, that's complicated. And there's lots of people who advocate for wilding are stupid and will do things that will actually harm wildlife as well. It, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the rewilding movement is perfect full of fallacies and problems and, and stuff like that. But hopefully by learning about rewilding, it's just learning to be better nature conservationists. And uh, there's plenty of need to make stupid mistakes and do the wrong thing here. Because we're humans, we're not. We're the little, you know, the monkeys. Well, here. You mentioned um, earlier on that sorry would be an excellent place to reintroduce wild cats. No. Pine Martins. Pine Martins. Oh, sure, I think so. No, we, we could. Wildcats could be, but Pine Martins at the moment. Wildcats need certain functional habitats that are a bit more. You don't have that. <laughs> that was about my question. Why would you say that? Would you never have that? Yeah, Pine Martins would actually not be too bad. This part is certainly going to Sussex, but it got the, the best density of, of wood and cover. It would actually be quite good for Pine Martins. So, what was the duty? doesn't matter. A lot of people have gone on you pine martins, pine, martin, pine, martin, rubbish. <laughs> Absolute garbage. Pine martins much prefer in other countries, Ireland, Europe, they much prefer to sit you with and pines. And the far higher densities. We only associate pine martin because that's the only living places they were left because we killed them everywhere else. Yeah. Here's all. What about bears? Well, <laughs> I love bears. Well, I guess that. Um, <laughs> bears have their own unique function in any ecosystem. Mm. If we had a real Grampian National Park, um, many people have told me from Europe that bears are easier to reintroduce than wolves. The problem with wolves is, yes, I can stick them outside in Venice or the new Grampian wildlife um, the Grandview National Park that's created in 30 years' time after my lifetime of lobbying and the introduction of a land value tax, which has been campaigned for by the Scottish Green Party, the Scottish Liberal Democrat Party, many campaigners in Scotland. It would create a national park. So I release wolves, right? Two weeks later, they're in Joy Book. Yeah? <laughs> wolves move. Bears, release them to, you know, wherever, Aberfeldy, right? Chuck them out by a locked tear. Guess what? It's not going to. So, bears have got, bears will cause, I know, I know bears only have a 20% um, meat intake, but that's in where they are in, in southern Europe, in um, eastern Europe, but bears have got the ability to have an 80% of meat. So uh, you chuck a bear out there, God help you, you'll be right here. You've seen a bear move? Yeah. 40 mile an hour? You know, even a red deer is going to have a hard job. Mm. And um, so they would have their function. And bears are dangerous. 
mm -hmm. or it'd be near one. But we've got bears in Spain, we've got bears in France, we've got mm -hmm. bears in Germany. They're all over the house. I, I went to a, a nice holiday in um, Chirven, uh, just at the start of the Engadino Valley, where they really space. Everybody's happy. As long as you've got enough space, they don't really associate that much with humans. And even when they do, they rarely kill humans, if anything. It's mostly to keep away. And, you know, if I went along and had my rewilded national park with a carrying capacity of bears and a carrying capacity of wolves and lynx, and I go along in my car, what are the risks to me that day in statistical chances of me dying? Well, the number one risk <laughs> is driving the car. Yeah. The number two risk is banging my head on the bathtub when I get out of the shower that morning and killing myself in a domestic accident. The number three risk is probably falling into a river and drowning. The number four risk is probably, in fact, on my journey through my bear-infested woodland, I am more likely to die of an anaphylactic shock from a bee sting than I am ever likely to get, and I'm talking a thousand, maybe ten thousand, maybe a hundred thousand times difference in likelihood mm -hmm. of that kind of death than introducing bears. So one of the other things we've got to do, fundamentals, you should have one. Teach people statistics. <laughs> There's another wonderful statistic um, when you're looking at trees falling on you, you know, being yeah. hit by a tree falling, you're more likely to die from a death from a wheelie bin than having a tree fall on you. Excellent. Which is yes. What's the number one way to get killed by an animal in this country? Trip over it. It's horse. Cows, yeah. Oh. Horse cow. It's mostly people falling off and banging their head on a horse. Car traffic accidents. I don't think you can car traffic accidents a lot, actually. I, did a, I wrote a piece where I analysed. I went through 20 years of National Office statistics looking at all the deaths by animals. Really hard. And I wrote a piece of things really independent a long time ago, which I listed all of the issues of what you can get killed by. Yeah? And um, the most dangerous wild, wild animal if we think not as after the bee, is probably the red deer. But by far more dangerous are domestic dogs, or terrorists. But then again, there's a lot of them. Uh, cows crushing industry for farmers, yeah? Just cows kneeling on farmers, crush, stir them, heart grows, <coughs> choke to death. And uh, horses falling off and being kicked by them. All that, really, really dangerous. And even after we reintroduce all our bears, wolves, lynx, it is going to make hardly any difference to those statistics because they're going to be way, way, way down the list. Teach, I'll have to have that. Teach statistics. <laughs> it's amazing what the truth is compared to perception, isn't it? Once we start opening up our minds to a little bit of truth, you know, it's, it's a dangerous thing. You start learning lots of things that we thought were true. Certainly, college. Full of misconceptions. Full of little brains, little apes, tiny little brains. <laughs> Don't you understand that much about life? I think we uh, we we had had as, as as much as our little brains, <laughs> our little monkey brains, <laughs> can possibly absorb. Unless, well, no, I won't ask for any more questions. <laughs> I think he's done a sterling job. Um, I found that fascinating, I'm sure you did as well. Uh, so I think let's give Peter a round of applause.